this hour of news. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu plans to meet US Secretary of State John Kerry in Berlin next Wednesday to discuss the spiralling crisis in Israel and the occupied territories. Since the start of October, 39 Palestinians and seven Israelis have died. In the latest violence in Gaza, three Palestinians have been killed and several others injured by Israeli forces. Then in Hebron, a Palestinian man wearing journalist's identification was shot dead after attacking a soldier with a knife. Another Palestinian was then killed in Nablus. And in Bethlehem, Israeli forces fired tear gas at Palestinian protesters. Well, the UN Security Council has held an emergency session, that's it there, to discuss the situation. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon condemned what he's called reprehensible Palestinian attacks on a Jewish holy site. Andrew Simmons begins our coverage from occupied East Jerusalem. After Friday prayers in the wake of a week of violence and deep-set fear in Gaza, more shooting from the Israeli army and more killing of Palestinians. The numbers of casualties rising as protesters attempted to breach the border fencing in several places, including the main crossing point into Israel. And these clashes came in Bethlehem, in the occupied West Bank. There were similar scenes in Hebron, and a Palestinian man disguised as a journalist with the word press emblazoned on his T-shirt was shot dead after police say he stabbed a soldier who was moderately wounded. All over the occupied West Bank, there were standoffs, conflict and injuries. In occupied East Jerusalem, there had been tension but no major incidents as Palestinians faced roadblocks and numerous checkpoints and searches in order to make what used to be short journeys. They faced long detours. Friday prayers at the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound, restricted to women and men over 40, was nothing new, but the mood was different. The security is heavy, and so are the restrictions. The numbers are far fewer than normal, and that's because of the new security measures. As the violence continues unabated at the same time as the UN Security Council in New York was talking about the situation, here the question was still hanging in the air, filled with tear gas. Will the Israeli Prime Minister's new security measures make any difference to this situation? Andrew Simmons, Al Jazeera, in occupied East Jerusalem. Well, let's get more from the West Bank now. Hoda Abdel Hamid is in Ramallah. Protests and the violence that follows happen on a daily basis now in the occupied West Bank. On Friday, the worst fighting was in Bethlehem. Tensions have risen there considerably over the past week, uh, simply because two protesters died on two different occasions, but one of them was a 13-year-old boy. Now, there was also uh, similar fighting and unrest in other areas here in Ramallah, in Jenin in the north, and in Hebron. Uh, violence that could indicate an escalation uh, for the occupied West Bank. A man dressed as a journalist uh, with a t-shirt identifying himself as press um, has walked towards a soldier and uh, tried to stab him. The soldier was lightly wounded, but the man was shot dead on the spot. Now, this is the first time it happens in the occupied West Bank, and certainly it is rising uh, fears among many uh, on whether this is a something that signals the beginning of a way of stabbings uh, that so far has not happened in the West Bank. And now to the UN, where the Security Council has been holding an emergency session. The Palestinian ambassador to the UN, that's Riyad Mansour, called for international help. We come to you today asking you to urgently uh, intervene to end this aggression against our defenseless Palestinian people and against our shrines, which, which are subjected to violations by the Israeli military occupation and by the Israeli settlers and by extremists. Well, the deputy Israeli ambassador accused the Palestinian leadership of inciting the recent violence. We face an enemy who is willing to die in order to kill. These people who kill innocent civilians in cold blood abide by no rule and have abandoned even the most basic mortality. 
Israel is taking every necessary means to defend its citizens and is responding proportionately to these attacks. I have no doubt that if on a daily basis your citizens were being stabbed in the streets with butcher knives or shot on buses, your security forces would have reacted in the same way. Meanwhile, speaking in Washington, D.C., U.S. President Barack Obama had this warning for both sides. Over time, the only way that Israel is going to be truly secure and the only way that the Palestinians are going to be able to meet the aspirations of their people is if there are two states living side by side in peace and security. I think it's going to be up to the parties, and we stand ready to assist to see if they can restart a more constructive relationship. Uh, but in the meantime, right now, uh, you know, everybody needs to focus on making sure that uh, innocent people aren't being killed. Live now to Al Jazeera's Patty Kilhane in our Washington bureau. Hi there, Patty. So Obama's top diplomat, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, he's set to meet the Israeli Prime Minister. What can they achieve at this stage? Yeah, I think, Julie, you could see, you see right there President Barack Obama not sounding all that optimistic that in his time left in office that he'll be able to see a two-state solution, leaving off a, a vague offer to help. We do know that the Secretary of State, John Kerry, will be meeting with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and we've been told that he also plans to meet with the Palestinian leadership. Uh, we don't know when exactly that's going to be. Not at all clear that Secretary Kerry has enough influence to really change the situation on the ground. Remember, he put a lot of time and effort into trying to come to some sort of understanding on a two state solution. He was rebuffed. Uh, so it doesn't seem like he has a lot of sort of pr uh, ways to pressure the Israelis. And when it comes to the Palestinians, not at all clear that they see the United States any longer as an honest broker. In fact, they've said that they are not an honest broker. And just to give you a sense of the political tension that is surrounding this issue, Secretary Kerry was at Harvard doing a forum and he said that the illegal settlement building, of course, he didn't call it illegal, but the illegal settlement building has led to the tension that we're seeing on the ground. Now, the state Department has been walking that back, saying he wasn't saying that settlements are an excuse for the attacks that are happening. So, very politically sensitive topic here in Washington. And, Patty, I suppose this is the big question, isn't it? What is the current U.S. broader strategy here? Because we heard Obama say it there, two state solution. I mean, we used to hear that phrase all mm -hmm. the time. But it been, it's been such a long time that there seems to have been any meaningful progress. And the question becomes now, what does the United States do at the UN Security Council in the coming months? Now, let's a little bit of history lesson here. Remember when Prime Minister Netanyahu was running for re-election and he said that if he's Prime Minister, there will be no two-state solution on his watch. He revised that to say there'd be no two-state solution as long as there's still violent extremists in the region. Uh, the White House was incredibly angry about that. And in an unusual move, they let it show. They came out and said that they were going to review their policy at the United Nations. So what could they possibly be talking about? Well, we believe that they are looking at the possible French resolution that would, in essence, say that Israel and Palestine had 18 months to figure out the final parameters of a two state solution or Palestine would be recognized as a state. Now, the U.S. has always protected Israel from the U.N. Security Council resolutions with its veto. So are they hinting that possibly they won't let that happen? We don't know. They aren't really talking about that. But we'll have a better idea because Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu is coming to Washington to meet with President Obama next month. When they meet, they tend to have a very feisty relationship. So we'll see what comes out of that meeting. Patty Cohen there joining me there live from Washington, D.C. We'll see what happens indeed. Patty, thank you. For more now on the situation in Israel and the occupied territories, let's bring in Al Jazeera senior political analyst Marwan Bashar. He's in our Washington studio. Hi there, Marwan. Uh, just looking at those uh, pictures and the footage from today, the atmosphere, the tension, the seething, the frustration is, is palpable. And I'm wondering, Marwan, who now can influence, which leaders or people can influence the Palestinian youth? None, actually. I mean, you can suppress them, you can repress them. The Palestinian Authority has already tried to block the TV coverage of those uh, uh, clashes and the demonstrations. They're also promising the United States that they will try to crack down on some of uh, the inciters and the organizers. But really, uh, if that's what's going to end up uh, to be, the Palestinian Authority's job is to suppress its own people because they are trying to resist the Israeli occupation. That, of course, is a disaster. 
On the other hand, of course, there's the Israelis and their uh, crackdown and, and uh, matrix control now on each and every street and neighborhood in East Jerusalem, as well as, of course, the usual barbed wire and walls and so on in the West Bank. But we've seen that happening before, Julie. We've seen that in previous uh, sort of uh, confrontations with the Israeli occupation. Now, of course, the Palestinian youth could end up being, uh, you know, tired, if you will. It's normal for that kind of situation when children face up one of the strongest armies in the Middle East. But at the end of the day, the point has been made is that the peace process generation is quite angry at the peace process because the only thing it got out of it is more barbed wires, more repression, more jails, more prison, uh, and less of an economic and education opportunities. Uh, and Marwan, we heard uh, something from Obama today, and he, he mentioned the, the two-state solution. And it occurred to me that I, I haven't heard that phrase in such a long time, which I guess represents the, the fact that we're so far away from any meaningful progress right now. Look, the United States, the administration here in Washington, finds it difficult to admit failure of the peace process. Because if it does, then it's admitting its own sponsorship of a process that went on for over two decades. Also, if it does admit the failure of the peace process and the two-state solution, it will have to explain why it continues to support the occupying country, Israel, with billions of dollars and armaments every year. It will have to uh, explain and justify its complicity in the repression of, a, of an occupied state today. As you know, just a few days ago, the flag of, the, of Palestine was raised in the United Nations. So at least theoretically, theoretically, Palestine is a state, but certainly it's an occupied one. And so you see an, an, an American position that is so weak and, and in some ways, as the Israelis would like to call it, hypocritical on this question. But it, it, it has failed and it cannot find an alternative for the time being. And Marwan, what about the UN? Does it, does it have a, a role to play? It could have a role to play if the United States would only allow it to. As you know, since the peace process began, it was an American attempt at saying the United Nations at Israel's desires and requests and demands will have to be sidelined. Or it, at best, it could become a junior partner in the international quartet. Remember the international quartet, Julie? It's that presumably those four bodies that include the European Union, United States, Russia, and the United Nations. So suddenly the international community became a junior partner of the United States in the peace effort in Israel-Palestine. It's a situation we've never seen ever in any conflict in the world. You know, when, when, when Iraq uh, occupied Kuwait, the United States did not say, well, let's wait to see if the Kuwaitis and the Iraqis will work it out. They sent half a million soldiers, and rightly so, under United Nations uh, 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 legality to liberate Kuwait. But here you have five decades on, of occupation, supported by the United States, which is Israel. And, and what do you do? You say, well, we'll leave the parties to decide. This is not the kind of thing you do when, another, when one country of the international community occupies another for five decades. Marwan Bashara joining me there live from Washington, D.C. Marwan, thank you.